Hello and welcome everyone. My name is Eva Keitel and I'm excited to be hosting today's webinar. This is CII's Reduced Cost with Digital Project Execution webinar. This webinar is sponsored by Hexagon, who is a dedicated member of CII. We will make time for questions, so as they come to mind, please enter them into the panel box in your screen, and they will be answered at the end of today's presentation. I'd like to welcome our presenters. Glenn Boyko is an industry consultant at Hexagon PPP, PPM, with over 12 years of experience in instrumentation and control system design, configuration, and implementation. Glenn has a deep understanding of the complexities of capital projects and how to guide organizations through the journey of change. Also, David Tuey is with Kentech, Global Services Line Director. David leads a team providing completions and commissioning services to some of the largest owner operators in the energy sector across the globe. Both of the presenters' contact information is available on the screen should you wish to contact them regarding today's discussion or engage them in social media. As a reminder, if you have a question for either of our presenters during the webinar, you may enter your question in the panel on your screen. All submissions are private and will be answered at the end of today's presentation. David, Glenn, I know you both have lots of great insights regarding completions and commissioning and how organizations can adopt a digital data-centric approach to optimize the handover process. So without further ado, I would like to hand the presentation over to Glenn to begin. Okay, thank you, Eva. We uh, appreciate the opportunity to uh, take the time to come and talk to people about you know, our experience, what we've seen uh, within both the owner operator and, and the EPC group. So where we always start is, you know, why are we here? Why do we attend you know, webinars like this? And really what it comes down to is most people that are engaged or tied into some type of project delivery are on a lot, under a lot of pressure to optimize project delivery processes, understand how they can manage both financial safety risks, all kinds of risks on the project, um, make sure that they're achieving zero harm throughout the execution phases of it, and then also trying to figure out how we can minimize the waste on our project and how we can ad adapt and, and respond to different types of, of changes on the project. So, you know, there's a lot of different items where there's areas for improvement, but also areas that are required within different uh, corporations and companies to really strive and, 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 and really be successful at. And so, what do we know about projects? We know that projects are incredibly complex. They have all different types of uh, people interfacing, companies interfacing, and what, what we see typically on the projects is your opportunity to influence the outcome of the project slowly diminishes as you go through the life cycle of the project. And so when you look at you know, the complexity of them of being uh, engineered globally, having procurement supplied by hundreds, thousands of vendors, uh, providing different types of data, different types of content, uh, looking at fabrication being dispersed globally, having mod yards, fabrication yards being done all over the world, having them shipped to, to different uh, construction sites. And then when you get to the construction site, you have thousands of different contractors on site that you have to manage and uh, understand their needs. And then we start looking at completions, commissioning, and all the different interfaces that you're trying to pull together with all these different types of contacts and, and information coming through. And then what runs across all that is all those different interfaces between all these different groups. And then we're looking at all the different data and system interfaces that are tied into that. So it's, it's an incredibly different, uh, sorry, incredibly complex 
um, process that, you know, what we see typically from completions, commissioning is engagement at the construction phase of the project where we have a very low opportunity to influence the outcome. And so really what the focus of this presentation from both myself and David is, is what can you do at the front or the feed stage of the project to really improve uh, the outcomes um, of the project. So really the basis of this is what we know is the complexity really typically cannot be reduced. It's, it's because of the way we're trying to drive cost on, on and schedule on projects, it's, it's very tough to reduce the complexity. Um, but really at, at, with a lot of uh, more front end planning, um, there's a lot of complication that can be reduced. Now, removing the complication, when we go in and, and talk to different people about, you know, what is your work process? What do you do? And because a lot of it is tied into paper-based processes, if you want to do a spaghetti diagram of how things worked and how they move things around a project, it's, it's very complicated. And so we really like to start from a very simplistic perspective of, okay, well, what, what do we do um, for completions? It, it, it's quite simple. We're looking at A check sheets, B check sheets. We're looking at punch lists, scheduling information, and your typical marked up P&IDs. So if you want to break it down to a very uh, simplistic perspective, this is what we're doing specifically on the completions commissioning uh, stage of the project. Now, what's really interesting about this is the engineering data that, that completions commissionings group need to do their scope of work. And so, when you start looking at the amount of data that they need for engineering, both tag data, design data, uh, and then also the documentation, you can start to see that there's a lot of other different uh, items that we can do to uh, that leverage that same data. So when we start looking at what are the parallel work processes that are utilizing that same engineering data? And so we look at this and we say, okay, well, there's Throughout the, throughout the project, when we're, when we're doing completions and commissioning, uh, typically what would happen is we'd go in and we'd say, okay, we want to get a, a, a tag list, we want an equipment list. Because all these different work groups are using that same information, we would go and say, okay, we need one from construction, we need one from uh, procurement, engineering, and you're ready for operations team. Now, what's really interesting about this is when you get when you do an alignment of that data, it's typically 65, 70% in alignment, uh, and mainly because a lot of these work groups need that data to do their do their job, so they have it early on uh, on the project, and there isn't a very rigorous change management uh, process uh, to actually streamline those changes of concurrent engineering through to those different work groups. So uh, what we're saying is throughout this project, you have all these people that are leveraging this data and there isn't an effective change management process because it would be very onerous to do that. And so the whole basis of this is to uh, provide that one one-stop location to consume that engineering data, engineering information for these different work groups that are using it to do their specific uh, part, of the, part of the project. The next thing that we start looking at is how do we improve the interface between construction and uh, completions and commissioning? And so we look at what uh, AWP does and uh, how they build the engineering work packages, how they define and build the uh, path of construction, uh, and then how they how they go through and, and define the procurement constraints. It's, it's a really great activity for planning um, but not really a great uh, specific functionality for execution, which is really what we lean on for completions and commissioning, where we start tying all of the uh, system interfaces into the installation work packages uh, so that we can start driving what the requirements are from a schedule perspective uh, back into construction and start looking at um, how we can start taking over custody of those systems a lot earlier. So, 
what we're really trying to do is uh, use completions and commissioning group uh, to work more collaboratively with the construction group to provide more direction within the field execution stages uh, of that project. And then also uh, provide more information so that we can have more forward looking uh, items for construction so that we have more insight into uh, what's happening. So a, a good example of, of what typically happens between construction and the completions group is uh, because there's a very heavily paper-based process and segmented um, uh, siloed groups executing on the project, uh, the completions and commissioning group has you know large delays um, in getting the information from construction. And the, the time frame to assemble the paper-based binders and package it up and get it to the group. Um, on some projects, we see anywhere from a week to, to three to four weeks to, to get that information in. So, you know, what, what currently happens is either it delays progress or people are starting their work um, and, and doing it without the proper documentation in, in an unsafe manner. So, you know, the, the really the whole mechanism behind improving the interface uh, between construction and the completions and commissioning group is really to use the IWP packages um, as a tie point to interlink the groups uh, in more of a digital uh, enterprise uh, fashion. Now, the next thing that we start looking at to really improve or remove the complication is the connected worker. What type of data uh, documentation are we flowing through to fabrication, construction, all those different groups to get more uh, value out of the people while they're at the piece of equipment in the field. And so what's interesting is there's so much uh, valuable digital data that can be embedded into the model, into the different design tools. And so by going through this process with people early on, really defines you know, what they're looking to embed into the engineering data so that it flows through um, into the different types of user groups or work groups uh, that need to do their job uh, and, and need this information um, as they go through the execution phase of the project. The other part of that is as they're going through different gates or different phases of the project, uh, they can be continuously validating the engineering information and then providing a feedback loop um, into that group. So when you're looking at this, the feedback loop can start a lot earlier in the fabrication stage, for example, even OEM manufacturer model numbers um, that can be fed back in um, so that somebody who is using this same information, say the ready for operations group, the manufacturer model number changes that impacts you know potentially what they're doing for maintenance planning what they're doing for procurement for spares um, so there's a lot of different ways where you can get more um, efficiency out of the people that are in the field um, going through that that digital execution part of it and then the other part that that's really cool about the, the digital execution part of it as well is then we can start building a lot of structure, work breakdown structure against where these activities are being done. Uh, so then when we start looking at roll up, apart, roll up reports, how we want to do certificates, how we want to transfer custody, how we want to gate through the project, all of this has already been established very early on in the project as to uh, where all these activities are happening, what the different companies, work groups, uh, how they're gonna be participating, the type of information that the vendors are going to be providing um, and all this gets tied into the digital content um, that becomes part of the uh, execution strategy for the project so the connected workers is a big thing for a lot of people um, and, it, and it, it, it provides a lot of efficiency throughout the execution phase specifically on um, administration uh, and then also from removing that that, that paper-based process and, and the storage of that. And I'll, I'll kind of get into that a little bit later on. The next thing that we start looking at is how do we build a collaboration structure for all these different types of companies, participants that need to access that information. So what's really important is um, the problem with a lot of projects today is everything is so segmented and, and segregated. So when we look at 
you know, the hundreds of contractors, all the vendors, all the people that participate, you know, they, they come with their own tools, both from, you know, a, a physical perspective of, of hammers and, and wrenches, but also from a digital perspective of their own their own software and things that they use to, to manage it. And, and, and really, that's the basis of a lot of the problems with turnover, handover compilation is when you look at all that content and, and the data, uh, it becomes a real struggle to combine it all uh, because it's not all apples to apples. And so really what you're looking at at the very early onset of, of the feed structure is, you know, how can we, what are the different types of companies that are going to participate? How do we need to segregate their data? Because what, what the problem is that you're going to come up against is when you pitch this idea to different companies of, of either a JV or an owner operator providing the application for all different companies, it really comes down to, well, we don't want our data in, in, in your proprietary system. We, we want to be able to ensure that everything that we're providing is proprietary and nobody else has access to it, but uh, the owner who is, who is purchasing our services. And so you really need to understand how you're going to segregate that data how you're gonna keep it separate, but then also have the ability to roll it up um, uh, for your own internal purposes. And so really you need to look through that structure and define those instances and have different levels of projects uh, within that. So the, the, the last few uh, segments uh, of my part of the presentation is really the, the context of what is in that instance um, that is shared across those individual projects. And so, what happens is within that instance, um, you should be looking at how you can set up a standard framework of how you wanna execute uh, different types of projects. And the reason that the instances have different work breakdown structures, uh, different requirements, different standards is because it's really hard to get procurement and the T's and C's of projects in complete alignment. So you need to be able to have the flexibility to have different levels of configuration for how you're gonna execute. Ideally, you wouldn't have to do that, um, but in, in a typical real world uh, scenario, what we find is it's really tough to uh, get good alignment with procurement, how they issue contracts um, to make sure that they're all in, in good structure. And, and I think we're on our way to doing that, um, but really what, what the whole uh, premise behind this is, is you need the flexibility to adapt um, and have different types of frameworks for your projects and different participants based on that. So really what, what this instance framework does is gives you the flexibility to have a different work breakdown structure, to have different requirements against that and different types of uh, uh, transfer of care custody control certificate uh, standards and turnover handover standards and also your information management standards and requirements. We talk about tag naming nomenclature, document naming nomenclature, uh, because they're not always the same. So uh, that gets into that standard framework. Now, the real, the real benefits uh, of doing that is uh, now we have the ability to expedite how we're gonna plan and develop the project. Uh, it's a single repository uh, for, for the data structure for the project as well. And then we can start standardizing some of that reporting against all those project participants um, in that instance. And the, the real benefit to that is you're measuring everyone by the same stick. So uh, when you wanna identify really who the, who the bad actors are or, or who, where the problem areas are on the project in early stages, uh, you can start seeing you know, where issues are with different levels of contractors and different participants um, within this ecosystem. And then also with the reporting is that it gives you the ability to do a roll-up report uh, across all those individual participants on the project as well. And then because you're going through and you're, you're building in um, all of the, the standard uh, alignment with tag naming nomenclatures, uh, essentially once you build up that framework and that structure, uh, once we get in the equipment list, uh, it, it'll bulk build what your requirements are for that project. And the last couple of things are um, the ITP process. Now, when you talk about the ITP process in a project, um, you know, it's, it's, it seems extremely wasteful in the sense that uh, it gets done over and over and over again for different levels of projects. And 
you know, when you talk to different types of, uh, of people, um, you know, sometimes they'll push back and say, well, you know, we don't want to take on liability um, by defining what the requirements are at an equipment level for different contractors that are going to be participating on the project. But when you, when you take a step back and take a look at the fact that you are going to sign off on that ITP no matter what, um, you're really taking responsibility uh, on that. So really what, what we're pushing is, um, you know, you predefine that for the project early onset for different equipment types, not just for completions, commissioning, but for every phase, stage, and activity for the project so that as as the project goes through detailed engineering, it starts getting built, you have your norms against those specific activities, uh, you're actually bulk building work scope based on a predefined requirement uh, for the charter for the project. So it, it really starts building a lot of structure into to how that's getting done. And then it also allows you to invest in, in digitizing those execution uh, processes that we talked through earlier. Uh, okay, so the next thing that we look at is, you know, what those primary data linkages are in that instance. So from a very simplistic perspective, uh, what we really look at is everything gets bound against the equipment tag. We look at uh, both uh, the process structure, the locational hierarchy for constructability and from a maintenance perspective. Uh, and then we go through, we're looking at all the different tasks from fabrication through operations and maintenance get bound against a work breakdown structure phase. Now, what that really allows you to do is have multiple levels of people participate uh, depending on what phase, stage, or activity they're bound against or what locational hierarchy or what system hierarchy they're participating on the project. Um, you should be able to start segregating what data they have access to, what documentation they have access to, uh, and what their specific work scope is and how they're participating on your project uh, for you. So really when you're setting up the framework, you know, those three tree structures are really the, the most uh, important components uh, of how you're gonna set up the framework and how these different companies are gonna participate um, on this ecosystem that's set up uh, for the project. Now, the last thing that we start looking at is what are the touch points? So now that we've kind of decided, you know, the different high level items that we're going to address, now we need to look at, okay, what are the specific data points, the data flow items that are going to flow in and out? So when we look at completions, uh, just a couple of examples would be systemization. So the ability to do the scoping in uh, a p and electronic p and system right in the engineering design tools. And, you know, fundamentally, some people believe that this should be done on the PDFs. Um, for us, you know, we believe it should be done at the source of the engineering information. And, and the, the real main driver behind that is we want people to do it as soon as possible. And the reason people do it um, on PDFs or PDF overlays is uh, because the change management um, to go through that process through concurrent engineering is, is very onerous. And so uh, by embedding it into uh, the back end of the engineering design tools, it allows you to accommodate um, concurrent engineering throughout the, throughout the project, but then uh, do the systemization and the scoping very early on. Now, what are the benefits of doing that very early on? When you look at uh, how to interface with construction, doing module reviews and constructability of reviews, um, you can start doing scenarios uh, of timing based on when you need those systems when the modules are meant to be delivered. So by embedding a lot of that data and that structure into the engineering design tools, it allows you to do um, a lot of scenario-based delivery uh, of the timing based on when the facility and the systems are meant to be started up. So it, it provides a lot of benefit um, from that perspective. Also, when you look at the, the work process or the amount of uh, brute force or effort that's required to do just the alignment of equipment ID to systemization is, is very onerous. So by doing it in the design tools, you can do it in the P&ID uh, design tool and then actually back correlate that data into electrical instrumentation information so that even cable tags have that those system attributes and that information. Now, when we look at data and, and, and documentation, this is a huge one too. Uh, when you look at the, the documentation and uh, building up work packages 
uh, for people to do completions and commissioning type of activities or any type of activity for that matter, uh, what this really allows you to do is build up the tag to document correlation. And when you start uh, actually doing work or work activities, um, what you should really be thinking about is how do you predefine what types of documents are required for different types of activities so that when I'm a worker and I'm checking out some type of a digital inspection, it's automatically going to route whatever documentation I need, most current documentation, down to my tablet for offline usage so that I can go through, do my work, and at the same time validate that engineering documentation, provide uh, the red lines or the as belts into that documentation and then wrote that back into the document management system uh, as we're actually executing throughout the project. So it, it's really about uh, streamlining that uh, that access to information and reducing a lot of wheel spin time uh, to look for that information. And then we start looking at uh, the construction. So I talked about the IWPs and that tra translation into that. So really the IWP should be transitioned into completions and bind uh, what the quality or the completions and commissioning activities are against those uh, IWP packages so that when you start going through the execution phases of the project, you're reporting progress against those IWPs, both from a work step or rules of credit perspective, but you're also looking at it from a completions perspective. So when you're measuring uh, between those two metrics, uh, you can start to identify when they get too far out of alignment um, and start correcting that before it gets uh, too far along the line. So there's some, some real benefits to creating some alignment uh, between the construction and that completions group. And then we start looking at, okay, project controls. How do we wanna start uh, pushing back in and getting more earned value out of a lot of that digital information? So by capturing a lot of those digital inspections and binding that against either a P6 or a project controls type of uh, tool because we've gone through the effort and gone through our plan and defined at, work, at what workflow state those planned hours become earned. Um, now we can start uh, tracking, okay, what specific workflow state are we at within these activities? Have they become earned? And what are the actuals on those so that we can start getting the analytics back into the scheduling people so that they can understand uh, where they are from their plan versus actual in a real-time perspective. When you're looking at it from a paper-based perspective, it is very delayed. And by the time you get the information you need, um, you're you're very much in a reactive state uh, where this is a little bit more forward-looking, real-time of what that information is, is what it's coming through. And the last, last couple things are, um, you know, what are we going to do to get that information into the SAPs, the oracles? And so when we talk about uh, turnover, handover, you know, for us, you know, we believe it's much more than engineering data and, and, and documentation. Uh, it's, it's punch lists, it's RFIs, it's management of change records, it's load sheets that go uh, to bulk build, what the requirements are for a maintenance system. Uh, so there's a lot of different things that should really be embedded into the digital process to remove a lot of the change management between the work groups. And then what it really allows you to do is when you get to different uh, gate reviews of the project and say you need to change or adapt on the fly for different systems or subsystems or, or different work breakdown structures, it allows you to be a lot more flexible, change the boundaries around the sandbox of what the content really is that you're gonna be turning over based on the changing circumstances uh, for the project and all that relational data comes together on the back end. So when you talk about turnover handover, um, it's it's really just configuring what data you want uh, and defining that sandbox around that data. Now, one last thing um, uh, is also the vendor data. Now, the really important thing about the early implementation here is building up a standard load sheet that vendors provide to you uh, to consume that data. Um, for most of our uh, people that we talk to, uh, this is very painful, consuming vendor data. And so really what, what the, the basis is, is predefining those templates that get provided to the vendor in the T's and C's of the contract and our requirement to fill out that data. And, um, you know, lots of people are having success doing that. Uh, because it's, it's you know, the, the other option is what currently is done is either 
uh, either a nested Excel table that you need to start scraping data out or, or custom utilities to pull it out, um, or you have brute force to transition that data out. So, um, you know, there's multiple different methods to doing that. Now, uh, building the business case. So when we look at um, uh, digital perspective, typically we see a 45 to 50% savings on resources and time, reduction in paper printing, uh, paper maintenance. So we also had someone come to us and say, you know, one of the construction trailers, they had so much paper, they actually had to go in and reinforce the floor uh, to, you know, to to actually withhold all the weight of all the paper that was being done. So it's, it's kind of an interesting comment, but just another you know, problem that comes up with it. Now, the other thing is the, the storage space of, and the record keeping. And then we get into the reduction of, of, of human error when we're talking about digital execution. Now, uh, a really good example of this is, you know, someone came to us and said, we were doing flange torquing um, and we had a translation error of the actual bolt size in the form and, and they picked the wrong, the wrong torque uh, based on the bolt size that was translated to the form. And so as a result, they had, you know, 300 leaky flanges um, on the project that they, you know, it took them a while to figure out because all the paperwork was done. Um, but really what it came down to, it was just, it was human error and, and translation of, of data. Now, so here's kind of a, a good example of, of, of what we've seen uh, fabrication where this this project they actually went from from a manual perspective and they transitioned into uh, digital and it wasn't really because they wanted to save time um, on the resources uh, it was because the, the issue they were having was they were getting work that was done in fabrication yard uh, overseas when it got shipped to site it wasn't really what they had expected and so they had a significant amount of unplanned work uh, on site so what they did was midstream through the project, they actually implemented uh, the fabrication and all the construction people uh, executing digitally. And so they had more insight into what, what was gonna get delivered uh, on the construction sites and had the ability to plan for it um, if there was gonna be additional work that needed to be uh, required. So that was really the main driver, uh, but this was kind of the outcome that they saw um, transitioning from, from paper to digital. Now, on, on the specific project, also because they had done that, they saw a 98% reduction in time to actually build up those compilation packages. So it's not just, you know, the handover pack at the end of the project. It's really every uh, custody transfer, gate review that you're going through and reviewing the information. Um, it's all done digitally. So you can take a snapshot of what the data looks like uh, um, at that point in time. Uh, but for all intents and purposes, uh, it stays live. Now. Another good example, uh, specifically on the on the quality perspective, is when you look at a project and um, you know what the root cause of of all the shutdowns are. You know, post post project, a lot of it comes down to the you know the design phase. You know, so the, there's a lot of things that we understand that that need to get changed. Now, um, what we're focusing on is how can uh, access to the information, uh, access to fabrication, and and close that loop to engineering. Uh, reduce some of this uh, design early on so those changes can be made early on. Uh, and the next part of that is, you know, the poor execution practices within the QA. So this is something that, you know, we feel is is easily resolved um, through more rigor process and, and, and digital part of that execution. Now, uh, I just want to run through this a little bit quicker so I can uh, get David on, but... Um, uh, the last few things is uh, you can understand the true status. So you get a real idea of, of what's happening on the project uh, in real time. And that provides a lot of leading indicators to, to make some informed decisions early on. Now, uh, this sounds really bad, um, but it, it, it's, it's kind of a real life scenario of uh, whoever has the best data, um, you know, in some type of a, a dispute, um, will win. And so really we're trying to provide the most granular information. Um, so when you get into that type of scenario, you have the ability to, to provide that and get that feedback. And the last, last item is the progressive inspection is, is really about um, creating a more collaborative environment between construction um, and removing any type of noise that there is uh, of, of any type of project and, and, and uh, things that are withholding um, the status of that. Okay, the last thing that I wanted to touch on before I get into uh, pass this over to David is the reporting. So you want to be able to 
uh, report across the portfolio of the project. So the, the nice thing about collecting and defining what those data points are is when you get to the reporting structure of it, it's very easy to start building up BI dashboards um, to the different types of reporting and, and provide that good, rich information that you need to uh, make informed decisions and, and pass it on to your management so they can pass it on uh, to shareholders on what the real status of your of your project is uh, and potentially how they need to address that with shareholders uh, early on so they can, you know, prevent any type of, of um, problems with, with that. Okay, so how do we get there? Really, this is what we're seeing, the scope growth within pre-commissioning commissioning. Uh, what we're really talking about is the early upfront investment that really creates a lot of certainty on the project. So uh, I'll pass it on to uh, David, who is really going to describe to you in a little bit more detail, um, you know, what that early upfront uh, investment is from a completions and commissioning uh, perspective. Thank you, Glenn. First of all, um, thank you folks for having me and taking the time to uh, discuss this interesting topic with us. Um, as Glenn mentioned below, above, what we're really trying to do is focus in on that front end area, which allows us to essentially kind of build our puzzle of commissioning and completions from the frame in rather than landing folks on the um, landing folks in the in the mid construction environment and expecting them to understand the parameter schedule and cost that has been set before them in the early uh, engagement of uh, the the planning and budgetary cycle for the commissioning so, uh, project and what we typically find is or what we like to compare that to is it's a bit like putting together a puzzle um what you what you would look towards is essentially looking to frame at the front end that the data and the, the, the parameters and where that data flows in order to essentially inform or best inform the other stakeholders in the EPC environment of what your expectation is uh, of moving that forward. And we kind of jokingly put that kind of putting the border around the puzzle that is commissioning. Um, what we like to look at it with that is kind of in keeping with the tune of um, of the uh, kind of project data map um, or the puzzle that we we are looking towards. We we essentially have six key areas um, uh, that frames the the commissioning execution environment that we look to seek with our clients a, a small upfront investment in order to frame that puzzle and and them six key areas which I'm going to go into some in, in detail with you folks on is the project management data plan, some interface management deliverables and how they flow that through. Glenn talked a lot about the kind of work breakdown structure. Um, I'll, I'll kind of touch on the EPC plus C integrated schedule. And also I think the complexity of change management control, how you actually look to set that up for success in terms of what ends up in the commissioning work pack environment. And some of the procedural and processes for that need to be commenced but not delivered in the early uh, in the early part of the uh, puzzle and then the organizational development plan and, and that's a, a, a small area but it's one that's worth noting in terms of the actions um the actions and the deliverables that is expected from your commissioning management team in the early environment so for the project data management plan as we work towards setting up the uh, setting up the, the project for success at a very early outset we look to define what data is of value to commissioning and how we can essentially inform the other stakeholders of what the parameters are that data that we require and how how can we best inform them of how we how we feel or what we feel needs to be delivered into the commissioning environment Every uh, each EPC and, and vendor and also the main automation contractor have different ideas of what commissioning requires. And the, the idea is that commissioning doesn't doesn't take a, a back step um, or a back seat in understand and hoping that that data comes from that environment, but rather takes a, a, a front row seat in, in ensuring that you can inform those people of what that data looks like. So defining what data is required. Then we look at our transition. So how how and when that transfer of data is supposed to take place? So 
for us, um, I'll go through on, on um, one of our other slides, you have a kind of AI enabled tool that can actually pull data from these design environments or these EPC environments and look to essentially set the parameters with the EPC or the vendors about how we would look to transition that data environment over um, into ultimately what is the central systems completions database, which essentially is the holder of the commissioning work packs, which our teams in the field eventually hold when they're sitting at the, uh, or when they're standing at the work face. And what you want to do is make sure that that transition has been um, sufficiently managed, that they have all the data sitting in the central completions database in order to execute as efficiently as possible and, and mitigate the risks of poor data transition. Then our validate stage is essentially as you're transitioning that data over, how does that data look in terms of the requirements that you've set in the definition stage? And there's some really good analytics tools out there now that can that we, we've been successful in defining where once that data comes across or is transitioned across, you can quite quickly do um, audit reporting by setting up the business rules in uh, setting up the business rules that applies to that data and quite quickly finding out what data is is meeting the integrity of the requirements that you set out at the define stage. And the idea of this is that you don't wait until construction is complete to turn to uh, the EPC environment and say, hey, you folks uh, haven't given us this or this data is incorrect. You're informing them as the design is happening that, you know what, uh, folks, we're seeing some data here that the integrity might not assist us that well at, at the call phase. And we probably need you folks to have a look at it. And it's essentially taking a more proactive approach to the quality of data that we're seeing transfer across. across. And then monitor. So tracking the changes. Um, this does feed into change management um, that, that I mentioned earlier. However, the monitor really looks at how what milestones do we want to set against that data in order to better assist our, our the EPC partners in the project in moving that data into our environment. So do we do we set up either uh, select milestones per silo? Do we offer float that we think might be available when engineering design? They are designing by systems, and then we move to this kind of we move to a, a bulk construction and then systems construction phase. And sometimes uh, that engineering of systems might allow you some float in order for engineering to be able to essentially monitor themselves and how they're collecting the data from the packet vendors or the automation contractor. And you might be able to afford them that opportunity to gather that data, to, to gather that data and have it essentially in better quality if your milestones for population of your da database was actually set up. And it's essentially just looking to monitor the milestones of that. This is just a simplified model of of the engineering environment or the tools that is in the engineering environment, um, uh, Spice, Spade, Spell, the 3D model environment, and some EPC 1 and 2 proprietary engineering software. And what we look to do is put in the middle of that bridge, um, or what is a good practice, is to put in the middle of that bridge an analytics tool that essentially is not just Excel import export, but that can monitor the quality of data that imports into the system completions database, which essentially holds the cold face work packaging for the commissioning team, and also allow the system completions database to build out and feed transparently through common work breakdown structures into the Primavera P6 environment to once again promote transparency and not have project executives coming to the integrated P6 environment and say, or the Primavera or schedule environment and say, hey, you know what, the, the P6 environment is saying we're 60% mechanically complete. How come your system completions database is at 20% complete? And what you get is a correlation between the, the common work breakdown structures that allows us essentially to validate through the right back from the engineering environment in, into the field environment that the system completions database is being actively updated in, in terms of work package completion. And that is then feeding in automatically into the Primavera P6 environment. To give you more of an idea, when people think of data, a lot of them will think of it's the tagged equipment. It actually is much more complex when you build up a system completions database map um, on the outside, you can kind of see what the inputs of, you know, provided by engineering, some of the uh, Spicewell SPID data, 3D model, vendor, FAT, 
And then the construction completion starts to build up air punches, MCs, red lines, MC dossiers, and, and mechanical completion certificates. But when you look into the data that actually causes the most complex issues around change management, in particular around spy and spell, um, you can start to see like IO module type, instrument range, minimum, maximum, alarm low and high, any changes in them environments in the commissioning actually causes work or loop checking to ground to a halt in terms of you're starting to look for management of change in order to either make a change to a software or make a change to a revision of the design. So it's much more complex in terms of being just tag data. So when you want to build a model of effective data transition, you really have to look at the data map that you're trying to work with in order to essentially build up that integrated EPC schedule and essentially look to create one version of the truth and also management to change, manage the change that exists by understanding the complexity of the data that you're actually trying to uh, try, that you're trying to move. For it's also it, it impacts me quite much actually how much interface management deliverables aren't considered um, in that data and, and what you find is that with a number of um, uh, in a number of different siloed environments for instance engineering and, and uh, package vendors you find different interface management deliverables that start to become affected by that data for instance the uh, software delivery dates and packages and has that data been prepared sufficiently well enough to match the software delivery dates that you look towards in the physical environment when that when that piece of equipment arrives at site that you already have your software developed and a good checkpoint is to basically outline the through through IA agreements or interface agreements in order to look towards what our requirements are in that data and this just starts to commence the process of commissioning taking a proactive approach by looking at some of these interface management deliverables which not all of them are on that list, but there are some areas that you could look towards to say, you know, this is what we could really start doing to try and define that project management data or project data management plan. The EPC schedule working backwards, um, Glenn did a really good job of, of kind of outlining the, the common work breakdown structures, but it's important to define that the, the commissioning work packages being considered at the engineering or EWP stage, actually does align the environment with beginning with the end in mind where you essentially can define the data grader that is actually going to be transferred in hand and the turnover part of the project by sequencing the deliverables correctly in terms of the engineering environment, but also procurement and construction. And one of the greatest areas of, um, of, of hold up for us on projects uh, in our teams uh, all over the world is routinely people look towards the big subsystems or the big systems i.e the process subsystems and believe you know if we get this there's 2000 or 3000 b check sheets to liquidate work and the funny thing is it's there's actually a defined sequence of activities that has to happen for commissioning to be able to execute the process systems and you really do have to look towards the telecommunications the electrical and then the instrumentation deliverables first, which are typically low value subsystems and generally start to get completed later than the bulk process subsystems in order for us to be able to energize them process subsystems and bring us to a point where we can start to loop check. So the sequence is extremely important that we look to sequence effectively and efficiently. And the only vehicle for us to do that actually is in the EPC plus C integrated schedule and ensure that we're working with folks to give them an idea of why that sequence is so important to us. Um, many times we end up with uh, commissioning teams basically wanting to get ready to work and we receive a process subsystem, but the supporting infrastructure around it hasn't been defined in the address schedule. And you actually end up at a point where um, it's difficult to actually, you're looking at temporary power, temporary comms coming in. And I think we, we believe that that's something that can be greater facilitated er earlier in the project by defining what that sequence looks like at a feed environment. And then change management control. Uh, we, we've had extreme amount of success on ensuring that hard deliverables are tracked in terms of, you know, your engineering deliverables, your software deliverables, ensuring they're tracked against the EPC schedule. And it is getting down to a level five. But what you're looking to do is essentially continue to populate your work packages within the sequence that was greater defined. And if deliverables that are being tracked start to slip past 
the required dates, what you're looking to do is essentially inform people that, hey, I know you guys are making a revision to the, to the loop drawings in this area, but that's actually going to be coming up. And ensuring that you take a proactive approach to change management control. And, offer, and, and often we find that most of the problems occur, in particular in the instrumentation side, is around the software. So when do software changes get locked in? And when do we want to ensure that when they are locked in, that we manage to change of it? Because what we don't want to do is continue to uh, recheck loops and have high failure rate and loop checking. Some of it is because of, because of uh, the data that's in the software, but also some of it is that can, changes continue to get made and, and the commissioning group are informed of that. And a good way to monitor that is the system completions database to ensure that you can kind of monitor that population of data and control that population of data once you move past a locked in point, which you would hope is around 100% complete. And then there is obviously the, the, at the very start of the project, defining what type of procedure and processes you're going to move towards. And, and, and these are just some of the deliverables that kind of helps uh, us in the early environment to essentially have that communication start up. And you're, you'll have your system completions plan, which essentially looks to be to inform the other uh, silo environment of what our plan, what our sequence is, what our mobilization will look like what our logistics and temporary facilities would be, also our simultaneous operations. It's when, when people talk about SIMOPS, they think it's um it's 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 one fold between operations. It's what what we find is we end up in dual simops environment where construction would actually be a SIMOPS environment when we're going live in a plant um, and we would essentially be looking towards controlling the hazards that we introduce into the construction environment and controlling it in a way that it might not be totally necessary to bring in that hazard, that that might impact construction progress greater. And by sequencing the schedule and making sure that, you know, that, that SIMOPS plan actually bringing a boiler on life to bring steam might sound like a great idea, but if it grinds your construction progress to a halt because you're now in a, an active environment, you might be able to plan around that, uh, plan around that uh, more effectively as commissioning and look towards essentially allowing float that might exist already to keep going um, and allow construction to clear up or, or, or remove themselves at the area so you avoid that SIMOPS environment. But also then plan the SIMOPS that could take place with construction to commissioning and also commissioning to operations. And then we obviously spares and racy, making sure that everyone's aware of what their deliverables is and how we how they move forward in terms of preservation, spares, who's responsible and what dates are required for that. And then the last the last the last point it's it's quite a simple one. Too many times we look now at commissioning and, and when commissioning teams come we meet with our clients and our teams would essentially be put in, uh, uh, these are the commissioning guys, they're there to plan commissioning. I think we need to make a, trans a more transformational role in commissioning that when we walk into an EPC environment that we're there to enable success of the engineering procurement construction to bring essentially the uh, project to a, to a point where commissioning are successful. The, the project is successful and so is commissioning. And because of what we're introducing here and some of the data delivery um, mind, mindsets we're looking to do, there's transitional roles and responsibilities, a, a, a role of responsibility of commissioning sitting in an EPC environment or, or a position sitting in an EPC environment actually sits differently to the responsibilities that are in the execution environment. So ensuring that you capture up front or defining as an owner or, or even an EPC, for, for instance, for the INC specialist, that, that they understand that their role is to greater involve themselves in that project data management plan and effect, effect, essentially look to affect how they transition. And the rest, they say, essentially is the easy part, um, which I don't know if, if is true, which is essentially the execution environment. Um, and, and just to kind of wrap up on that, our, our goal is essentially to put people in the value add environment through our work package creation to ensure that we can reduce the uh, the errors or integrity of data that we hand to our craft to to ensure that they don't become frustrated with rework with uh, poor data delivery poor work pack preparation poor sequences of schedule and give them uh, give them the ability to have the they have the entire work pack flow process ensure that to, to have them standing in the value add environment and create and be given an opportunity to have, be productive um, in a commissioning environment.
So that's it from my end. I know we're going to go to a question and answer session. Great job, guys. This is a really good presentation. So we do have a couple of questions. And um, the first question is, you save time at the end of the project, but what is the percentage increase of time at the beginning of the project? Well, I, I can take, do you want me to take that, Len? Yeah, you, you're probably more uh, appropriate to answer that. Yeah, it's funny. What, what we're looking at, um, if we kind of dissect that, what you're essentially looking at is um, if you look at the overall uh, ma commissioning management budget as opposed to the, the directs budget or, or indirects budget, you're looking at essentially a, a, an upfront investment of of um, three, four, five percent of the management budget to be to come earlier into the feed environment and carry through through into the engineering. And a lot of people, it's it's a question that's asked a lot, and it is a great question that. You know, does that mean I'm going to have 30 or 40 commissioning people in my office? And fundamentally, that is not the case. What you would be looking at is system completions database person, uh, which would handle the systems and data transition, and some discipline leads that would monitor that and ensure that, that it's meeting the requirements that we would set up, and also your planner schedule. So it's 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 a small number of four to five, six people that commence that activity, and then it becomes about scalability. How big is that project? does it become a multi-EPC environment and do you have to actually transition across the globe? I've worked on projects where, you know, it's it's been one EPC, but I've also worked on projects where you have four to five EPCs and, and that scale gets bigger because you're in different environments. Excellent. So this is also along the lines of the cost and the benchmarking associated with the value. Um, what has been the maximum value of a project that has executed this type of digitization? Yeah, that's a good question as well. So we've had um, some that have ranged uh, anywhere from uh, 800 million CapEx uh, over to um, 32 billion. Uh, but then also we do have lots of uh, services companies like Kentech uh, doing lots of smaller digital execution projects for owner operators on their behalf. And, um, you know, their scope, uh, because they do multiple projects for the owner range anywhere in value from 100,000 to, you know, 20 million. So uh, I think once you set the framework up of the, the basis of, of how you're going to execute, um, it's it's repeatable and scalable. So it's it's really kind of a one-time upfront investment of, of how you're going to do things. Um, but the whole idea behind it is uh, build once and use many. I would just add to that um, uh, two recent projects that we executed, one about 800 million and one about 3.5 billion. The, the owner really committed to this to this to this digital execution um, concept, and realize the benefit in their productivity in the field. Um, um, I would say it was an increase of 0.4 percent. But they're the types of scale that um, that we're starting to move towards. And, and obviously, Glenn mentioned some of his stuff in, uh, in terms of major project environment that uh, would more borderline on the giga side. Okay, so this type of not only cost savings, but efficiency has been implemented in live projects that you all have been part of. Yeah, absolutely. Okay. Yes. Is there any that you could share that wouldn't be, you know, in that confidential thing that maybe we would know about? Um, from my perspective, okay. I, I'm, I'm pretty sure I'm, I'm infringing on some sort of NDA there. <laughs> but don't say anything. We're okay. Yeah. I was just curious because, um, you know, sometimes people like want to know, is it real? And so we know it is. Um, another project, another question is the project data management plan in which phases of the project should be started. So when would this best be implemented? This is absolutely a feed deliverable. It, it is um, essentially uh, commencing the uh, the definition, transition, validate, and uh, validate and monitor concept right at the outset. 
because what you actually find is that once it moves, to, once engineering kicks off, it's actually too late um, from a, from a, a work process point of view to to disrupt engineering in its flow and have them consider this in in their execution. So we've had the greatest success of this, where it's been at feed. We have been able to come in, you know, midway through engineering and get some form of it in. But I found I found that it, it was a it, while we got to where we needed to be, it, it, it did become a slight disruptor. And, and if you can program that type of philosophy into the feed environment, it, it helps everyone understand before they kick off that that, that, is, that is the ideal scenario. Okay, so start early and go through the entire process. So what are the IT tools for this type of a project? Sorry, I missed that, uh, IT? Information technology, the various okay. types of technical tools that might need to, might be needed for implementation. Yeah, I think that, yeah, I think I think that uh, it varies from from project to project. Obviously, we're we're biased to you know some of the some of the Hexagon PPM solutions, and uh, I think you know one of the things that we really like to you know, enforced to a lot of our customers is we do have applications to cover start to finish, um, but then we do have the ability to integrate in, you know, legacy systems that, that customers do have. So, um, you know, it's every project's uh, a little bit different, um, but, um, you know, any type of design tool with the technology today, um, typically you can set up the framework um, and, and use uh, uh, web APIs to, to tie all those in together. Excellent. Well, unfortunately, that is all the time we have for questions today. For those of you who have questions that were not answered, our presenters will provide you with a response directly via email. And on behalf of CII and all of our attendees, I would like to thank Glenn and David for the presentation. Hexagon will be at our annual conference this year um, in August, our August 19 annual conference. So for those of you that want to meet and greet and get to know the representatives of Hexagon, you will be able to see them there. And the recording of this session will be posted on the CII blog page by the end of this week. So thank you so much for taking the time and joining us today, and we look forward to the next webinar. Stay tuned and have a great day.